Unbelievable with Kurt and Luis. Unbelievable, we're here to please. Telling stories, some true, some tall, some historic feats, some big, some small. Unbelievable with Kurt and Luis. Bam. Wow. That one goes out to you, Nat King Cole, wherever you may be. That was amazing. Luis held unbroken eye contact with me that whole time, and it was extremely sensual. Welcome, everyone, to Unbelievable, the show where I tell my good friend Kurt two unbelievable stories from history. But here's the catch. One of them's real. One of them's fake. And I got to guess which one's which. That's right. My name is The Man Luis, joined here by The Myth, Kurt Danner. And the word <laughs> is still out on the legend. Uh, if you have any, any, any clue on the legend, let us know. Reach out to us. Before we get started with the story, since I'm going to be taking over the show this time, I've got some, some wild tales to tell Kurt, uh, but before we get on, I need to set a level on what's real, what's fake, what, how to separate fact from fiction. So Kurt, do you have a little fun fact to get us in the mood of, of historical detective work? Oh yeah, we're ready, baby. Let's hear it. So, tell me, Luis, true or false, the University of Oxford is older than the Aztec Empire. I think that is a true story, Kurt, because, uh, uh, well, yeah, I will tell you it's true, because the Aztec Empire, surprisingly recent. That is correct. It is true. Oxford opened in 1096. The Aztec Empire began with the founding of Tenochtitlan in 1325. Yeah, you know, it just goes to show that, listen, I don't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, that was like, like a, a long shot for me, because there was, what are the odds you don't know the age of the Aztec Empire? But if you didn't, and I, I exposed you live on the air yeah the the aztec empire surprisingly recent but the uh, the mexica culture and the culture surrounding it have been around for longer than oxford well what about how long the oxford culture was around before they oh you're building, right you you're know? right they were throwing frat parties all the way in the 800s yeah well most people don't know this but the various education departments of oxford were actually several tribes before they unified into their oxford empire yeah yeah they uh actually the society of skull and crossbones of oxford built stonehenge yeah back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> bunch of druids <laughs> all right kurt well thank you for that little fun fact i think that's gonna that's gonna get us in the mood for today and you know I'm going to take a bit of a turn, and I'm glad we mentioned not only the Aztec Empire, but Oxford, because I seem to focus a lot on stories from the my, my home country of Mexico to to try to fool you a little bit. But today, I'm going to change the, the scene a little bit. I've talked enough about pre-Hispanic Mexico and colonial Mexico. We're going to move on from that because we 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 don't want to we don't want to use old material always. We're we're going to keep it fresh. That's true. Somebody somebody told me the other day that that based on listening to this podcast that if there was a world map according to Luis, it would just be Mexico and Western Europe. Well, uh <laughs> which is a scathing critique. <laughs> yeah, that's that's wild. Well, um I guess we're going to stick with that theme because the two stories I have today are from Western Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're, um, unfortunately, we are going to stick with that. But thank you for telling me, Kurt. That's going to be very enlightening for future episodes. Yeah, you can think about that as you lay awake at night. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, a lot of sleepless <laughs> nights are going to come from that comment. But that's not going to be just now because right now I have two stories for you. The first one, Kurt, is going to come from the land of France. You familiar with the French, Kurt? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've I've been to Paris three times. All right, no need to brag. Um, little little brag. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I, it's not even like on purpose. I just keep flying through the airport on the way to somewhere else. That's even worse. <laughs> Kurt. Yeah, it is. Now that oh, I've been it. to Paris, but I didn't even want to be there. <laughs> Yikes. Contractually obligated to be in Yeah, Paris. I had to stop by the Charles de Gaulle airport just briefly. Ugh. Ugh. Horrid. But we are going to move to France and talk about the French, because one thing the French are known for is drama. Their wicked ability to spark things out of conflict and emotion and, and, and trials of the heart. And one thing that the French are really... Thank goodness we got away from talking about Mexico so we could get to a country that really appreciates drama. All right, Kurt. I've had it with you. <laughs> but anyway, Kurt... Uh, the French are really good uh, uh, at uh, this specific, uh, many things, but one specific thing is dueling. 
They're known for their duels. Okay, very cool. There's, there's been a lot of duels throughout French history. You know, people get angry, want to solve their conflicts by drawing their sabers, drawing their pistols, and figuring things out. Make sure to hold the other person accountable for their honor. And through the history of France, there have been a lot of uh, what you could call wacky duels, Kind of crazy duels. Well, like they use balloon swords for one of them? Or what happened? Well, I'm glad you mentioned... This duel will only be with water guns, but it's still to the death. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually glad you mentioned balloons, Kurt, because this is going to be tangentially related to that. So we're going to go back to the 1800s, 1808 to be specific. We're going there because... In 1808, in around May, there were two, two French gentlemen, uh, French high society. One of them was Monsieur du Grand Pré and Monsieur Le Pic. A couple gentlemen, Grand Pré and Le Pic. And they had a quarrel. Grand Pré and Le Pic. Grand Pré and Le Pic. I apologize for, my, for <laughs> the, my butchering of French. But these two men, these two high society French men had a quarrel uh, mm. because they were both having an affair with the same woman oh you hate to see it. you hate to see it so they're... wait not not a not a relationship they're both having an affair with the same woman yeah 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 they're they're both having an affair with this same person and so jealousy ar ar <laughs> arose between these two men that that said hey i'm already sleeping with her why are you and this woman was a mademoiselle tiravi uh who was a singer at the imperial opera of france so so this singer had captured the attentions of these two men and these two men decided that we were we must have a duel and whoever wins is going to win the affections of mademoiselle tira v nice so it's a duel that that really happened because of jealousy oh okay, wait can, can i ask had they both already been with her or is this just like preemptively one of us is going to make a move and we're going to duel to see no they they were already the they were already involved with her Okay. They were already they had already had affairs with this woman, but they found out that they were they were sleeping with the same person and and got a little bit jealous of one another. Mm, um, that's tough. So they decided to settle this in a duel. And there's there's a quote from this book from the time, a contemporary book that says they agree, agreed to fight a duel to settle their respective claims. And in order that the heat of angry passion should not interfere with the polished elegance of the proceeding, they postponed the duel for a month. <laughs> so <laughs> they, 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 they decided that. We we need to we need to take this into matters. We're going to have a duel, but we're not going to let this 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 fire of emotion rile us up, which surprisingly mature, I, I will say. Um, and not to get into stereotypes, but for the French to not act so quickly because of love and matters of of intrigue and and, and sexual interest, pretty 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 exciting. So they waited a month. I know. That, yeah, the scheduling of it. It actually, it's more like a like a British stereotype. Where they're like, "Could you pencil in my duel for this Thursday, please?" <laughs> we are we are going to fight each other to the death, but not today. Today, I've got I've got stuff to settle. You know. So yeah. Uh, after this, they agreed that they would settle their their affairs in a month, and the lady Mademoiselle Tira V agreed that she would quote bestow her smiles on the survivor of the two if the other was killed. Ooh. So there was. She's loving this. Yeah. this. She's having a great time. Of course you would. You work in the opera. You have a flair for the dramatic, and you have these two men willing to yeah. die just to sleep with you. That's a, that's great. <laughs> so so Monsieur Grandpre and Monsieur Le Pic decided that the way they were going to settle this was uh, to have a duel, but not a regular duel. They were going to get on hot air balloons or gas balloons Whoa. To, to settle this. And they were going to inflate two balloons and shoot each other. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> and so That's very fun. It's very exciting. So they used this month. Uh, well, well it, it may seem in this quote set that they used it to to not get carried away in the heat of the moment. They actually use this month to build balloons, gas balloons, so that in a month time when the balloons were ready, they could set up. So on the morning of May 3rd, 1808, Kurt, in the Tuileries Garden in Paris, these two men started setting up their balloons. And it was decided that they were going to hop in the cart of the balloon, in the basket, 
each one with their seconds, and they were going to be armed, not with pistols, because a pistol would not be big enough. They would be armed with blunderbusses, which wow. is an early version of a shotgun. They would be in this basket of a balloon with a blunderbuss and attempt to shoot, not necessarily at each other, but at each bal- each other's balloons. So the, is, the second is in the balloon with them? Yes, the second is in the balloon with them to Wow, help what them. a ride or die. That's They're going true. up in the balloon too. This isn't even their beef. And, and the thing is, so one person is the person in charge of shooting. So the duelist is going to be shooting. And the, and the second is in charge of helping them operate the balloon. Because you can't really operate a balloon and shoot at the same time. So, yeah, these seconds were totally willing to die for for their duelists, <laughs> which is insane to me. They were fully, fully willing to to drop dead if their, um, if their sidekick had uh, a lousy aim. Okay, that's true. It is, it is kind of crazy that they were willing to do that. But also, Luis, mm-hmm. if one of us came to the other one and said... I'm going to have a duel in a hot air balloon and I need a second to operate the balloon. Would either of us hesitate to get in the balloon? I mean, come on. <laughs> Frankly, Kurt, uh, I would get into the balloon just knowing that you're a good shot. And I think you would get into the balloon with me knowing that it would just be a fun time. <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, I'm not here to win. I'm just here to die in a cool way. <laughs> exactly. And, and what's crazy is that they started, they were in this public park, the Tuileries Garden in Paris, setting up their balloons, blowing them up and everything. And, the people that were, I mean, it's a public park, so the people, the crowds gathered looking at these people getting into the baskets of the balloon, and the crowd of, of spectators just thought they were watching a balloon race, so they started cheering them on, saying, hell yeah, you're going to blow up this balloon, woohoo. <laughs> oh, it's a it's a balloon race, all right. Last one to the ground wins. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and in the morning of May 3rd, these men, the balloons are all ready. The crowds have gathered to see these two men. They get into the baskets with their seconds and their blunderbusses, and they start rising up into the air. Now, according to, to sources, contemporary sources of the time, this the wind was was great. There, there, it wasn't too terrible. It was a perfect day, beautiful day. They started rising, and these two balloons were about 80 yards from each other. Okay. So not terribly far, but an, a nice sizable distance. And as soon as they were half a mile off the ground, so very, very high up, they decided to commence the duel. Yeah, I was going to ask, how do they decide when to start? It feels like they need like a third referee <laughs> balloon. <up> there, you <laughs> know? A third balloon just to yell. The neutral balloon, well, yeah. Uh, uh, so there was a signal uh, supposedly that came from the ground that told them when to f- okay. when to shoot, uh, which I think that that can be very difficult. If it's just a guy running up and yelling, hey, guys, go, fire! go, quick, go, yeah, go. Like, you can imagine there's a lot of, of, of uncertainty on when to fire. Also, side note, I, I would love to know if, if Mademoiselle Tiravi was in the crowd <laughs> cheering them on. She had to she be, had right? To be, this right? is her show. There, there are no accounts of this woman there. But anyway, they, they're half a mile off the ground, and the signal is given for them to fire. De Peak got the first shot with their blunderbuss, but fully, okay. fully missed, ah, which, yeah, yeah. which he was aiming for a balloon. A huge balloon, <laughs> uh, and there was a there was a quote that I found, and I'm gonna paraphrase paraphrase it a little bit. That said, it would it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic that, that he missed. Um, Couldn't hit the broad side of a balloon, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and which meant that since Le Peak fired first, the other the other man, uh, Monsieur Grand Pre, fired again and shot the balloon, and the balloon exploded or not exploded. oh yeah because but... i just i just realized because it's not like like go nuts once you once you start it's not like you can just shoot as many times as you want right because it's right. dueling rules so once you fire a shot you're just you, if you, you miss yeah, you're, you're just done. waiting exactly to get shot. exactly and plus you have a big big old blunderbuss which takes a million years to reload yeah <laughs> so uh, just abysmal experience for for that guy's second who watched him <laughs> miss and was like now and now we wait to die exactly just imagine being uh lay peak second just looking at your man <laughs> fire the shot and say oh no <laughs> <laughs> he saw the end before his eyes. So Grand Pre fired and 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 shot up the balloon, and the balloon collapsed. And they're half a mile up, so it starts to go down. It, 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 one of the one of the sources of the time says that the car descended with frightful rapidity, and Le Peak 
this is this is quoting this contemporary article saying Le Peak and his second were dashed to pieces on a housetop. Oh. So they just crashed oh. onto someone's house. Someone minding their own business, mind you. <laughs> Someone's having their breakfast in the morning of May 3rd, 1808. All of a sudden you have a big old balloon that just crashes through your front front door. The kids these days. Back in my day, we used to duel on solid ground. Now they got their fancy hot air balloons. Won't keep off what with not my lawn and such with their big old balloons. <laughs> what is going on with society today? A bunch of degenerates on their balloons and their blunderbusses. Yeah. So this man died. Uh, Le Peak and his second, for all reports, that died. And Grand Pre and his second were successfully flown off and landed about seven leagues from Paris. <laughs> Cool. So they just cool. fancily enjoyed landing far from Paris, fully set to win. Because this man, literally, in, in his experience, just flew up, fired a gun, and then landed land, landed very, <laughs> very calmly. Floated off into the sunset. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and now, now we don't know whether or not Mademoiselle Tiravi actually granted Grand Pre her affections. But you can imagine that. Oh, could probably. you imagine? If it... That'd be terrible for that man if if that didn't happen. <laughs> exactly. No, I think it'd be worse for the second, if I'm being frank. The second's going to say, That's you made true. me go through all of this, this fear and terror, <laughs> just to not. So it's unclear whether uh, the opera dancer, singer, Mademoiselle Tira V would have gotten the affections of, or accepted the affections of Monsieur Grand Prix. So yes, that was the end of Monsieur Le Pic. Uh, who died at the hands of Monsieur Grand Prix on a balloon fight, uh, which great, honestly. That's that's fun. It's got me thinking. You know that. Okay, do you know were they the first ones to do to do a duel in balloons? Was this something they came up with, or was this something other people had done? This this wasn't this this did not have a a precedent. I think they set the precedent. However, there was another story of a Frenchman in a balloon shooting pistols. So okay. I, it's unclear, Kurt. It is unclear whether they set the precedent. But, I mean, it made the rounds. There's a newspaper from Britain that, that quoted this, saying this event a couple months after the fact, too. So it's probably set a precedent, but just the fact that these guys just out of nowhere. Because before, yeah. before this, there isn't any record that balloon fights were a thing. So the fact that they said, let's, do, let's take a break, have a month, and build a balloon... Or they probably went to their second set. I had a, gr- I have a mm-hmm. great idea. Hear me out. I just, Balloon I just like that they, they saw, you know, the dueling medium and said we can innovate this. You know, I wish we'd kept that trend up. Like today, we could be settling our problems by like dueling on hoverboards. I think that'd be pretty cool. You know what I mean? Ooh, yeah, yeah nice little hoverboard. Just, I mean, joust. just, just think of nice. all the different vehicles that you could have a duel on, like jet skis. That would be pretty fun. No, wait, I got it. Water yeah. skiing, and it's like. Your second is driving the boat, Ooh, yeah. and you gotta, you gotta. Have you ever tried to water ski before? It's really hard to to stay like up on the water. I've never successfully done it, but you you gotta be able to successfully water ski and shoot your blunderbuss. <laughs> oh wait, we, way, we, my, we would have yeah, blunderbusses. I'm keeping the blunderbuss. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one constant throughout duels is that we should have stayed with blunderbusses. Really. Yeah. Change everything else. Keep the blunderbuss. Yeah. Or maybe I don't know. Get a Segway. Get a Glock. And go crazy. Little, little AR-15 on, on some jet skis action. Who knows? I think we're, we're, we're due for another duel sometime soon. I respect them for, for saying, like, let's figure out how to one of us kill the other one in the most French way possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good for them. But also, also yeah, the, the balloon idea. I don't know if it's a winner. <laughs> but I, I respect the grind. Word, <laughs> word is still out, but we, we respect it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very very cute story. Thank, what thank what you. else do you have for me? Well, you? I have another, an, another story, Kurt. We're, we're going to move to a different part of Western Europe since we know that's my uh, my exclusive knowledge of the world. Ooh la la. We're going uh, to Austria? Actually, we're going a little north. We're going to Germany. That was my uh, next guess. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to, to Germany. And if I was already butchering some French names for last story, get ready for me to bu- butcher some German names. Uh-oh. It's going to be really fun. And sorry to any German listeners. <laughs> and also to my mother of German descent. <laughs> but we're going to move to Germany. And it's because I'm going to talk to you about a ring that was bestowed upon actors. And continues to be uh, bestowed upon actors. This is one of the highest awards for acting in Germany. Or ger- the German-speaking world, really, to be, to be more precise. It's called the, the Franz 
Kraus Ichlügering for the highest achievement in acting and its successful diffusion. Also, just commonly known as the Ichlügering or the German acting ring. We're just going to be calling it the German ring. Yeah, that, <laughs> that one seems like it's the easiest by a lot. Yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to say <laughs> Ichlüge all 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 episode long. So we're just going to call it the ring. Now, what is this ring? Where does it come from? Currently, it is it is gifted to people that have made broad advances in the world of acting. Considered to be uh, the the people that bear this ring are considered to be the best living actors uh, in Germany or the German speaking world. Uh, like Adam Sandler. Except in Germany. Exactly. Exactly. Imagine. If, <laughs> I mean, have you seen Waterboy? Crazy. I'm already regretting. I brought Adam Sandler into this. I'm just remembering all the bad Adam Sandler movies. Let's let's move let's on. Let's move on. Stop the podcast. We brought up Adam Sandler. Stop Adam Sandler. Stop Adam Sandler. <laughs> but this ring, the reason it's called the the Franz Krauss Ichlüge ring is because it's named after a actor, Franz Ichlüge, who in 1843 made this this golden ring that uh, it's like diamond encrusted, it's golden, and has a piece of porcelain on top that has his face on it. To one, one Franz Ickluger ring to rule them all. Exactly, one to bind them. But the reason it has his face on it is because it, it's, it's representing him in 1815 when he had his most famous actor role. Okay. So at the time, he was one of the most renowned actors, but in 1843, he was around like 40, 50, like early 50s. He was aging. People didn't really recognize him anymore. So he made this ring of his most popular appearance as the role of Siegfried in a play from the time so that when people would ask him who he is, he's like, I was Siegfried in 1815. And when people would call, would say, that's a lie. You're lying to me. He would be like, nope, check it out. I've got a ring. This is me. <laughs> so, so a bit of bit, bit of a narcissist, but I mean, it's he's an actor, and he was a world renowned actor that's losing his glow. So, you know, it makes you feel bad for the guy. He was he was struggling with not living in a time period where the verification check mark exists, <laughs> and he needed someone yeah, to this verify man, his yeah, exactly. accolades. This man, this man would have <laughs> killed to be Twitter verified. Um, Could have avoided all this if he just knew what a Twitter moderator it, was. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Um, but as you know, uh, or maybe I don't know if you know, Kurt, but Siegfried is this famous character of Norse mythology that was then uh, translated into German and is now known as a bit of a folk hero around Germany. So Siegfried, uh, he's the guy that like saves Brunhilde. You've probably yeah, heard that okay, from Yeah, okay, that's what yeah. I know it from, yeah. So yeah, so yeah this, is, this is from the, that famous story, Siegfried. So he was famous for portraying Siegfried. This man, very famous, made this ring. As I said, it's a golden ring with porcelain on the top with his face. And it's pretty big. It's like a Super Bowl ring almost. <laughs> because okay. if you're going to have your face on a ring, well, you got to let people recognize you. So it's pretty large, right? He was, uh, Franz, Franz Ekluge was the president of the Regional Actors Guild in Hamburg. So uh, when he died, the people that got to keep this ring was the, was the guild. Right, the, the, it went straight to the guild. He was such a recognized member of the public and a recognized member of this acting mm -hmm. guild. So the guild received this ring. Now, the guild kept the ring. They said, this is important. It's just a bit of a relic of our past, one of our former presidents, one of the best actors in Prussian German memory. So we're going to keep it, see, see what's good. We're going to fast forward a couple of years, um, which, by the way, Franz Ickluge made this ring in 1843, and he died in 1844. So he wasn't, oh, no. he wasn't able to, to really parade around with his ring and show yeah, people. he didn't get to really savor it. Yeah, so, so it kind of stayed more of a, of a, of a, of a, of a not spiritual significance, but a, a, a internal significance, right? So it meant more yeah. to the people that knew him. The guilt kept it uh, for several years, so this man died in 1844. However, if we go to 1875, Richard Wagner, famous uh, composer, German composer Richard Wagner, one mm -hmm. of uh, one of the most renowned uh, or known composers of the time, he is famous for the Ring of the Nibelund, is is his series of of operas and the Götterdämmerung, which is like a whole series of Norse operas that make, it's like the MCU, 
but about Norse heroes. Um, <laughs> one of one of the of the operas in this ring cycle, as they call it, which I, I think is pretty ironic. That's called the ring cycle, is called Siegfried, and this opera when it released was very huge it it, it it premiered in 1875 and it became huge and since it was a german composer talking about a german folk hero well we're back we are back and living the magic of of old old actors oh yeah so this guild decided hey now that we have the character of siegfried back and we have a new person that's really well known for playing siegfried in the opera let's give him the ring, you know, as a sign of, of, of solidarity of, hey, you're a great actor. You are going to mean a lot to German history. So let's give you this ring of one of the greatest actors of last generation. And it went down, uh, the ring went down to a man named Georg Haas, who was the person to premiere Siegfried as Siegfried. And uh, he got the ring, very exciting, became one of the most famous famous actors of the time and Haas eventually gave the ring to a fellow actor for safekeeping before a skiing trip to the Alps which he promptly died in that skiing trip. Very German. <laughs> Very German and so this <laughs> this person the the person he gave the ring to who was named Karl August Göring received this ring after after Haas's death and he decided okay I'm also an actor I'm going to to pass this down. This ring was passed down to me. I'm going to pass it down to the next actor I think is the best actor. So Carl August Göring receives this ring and decides I'm going to make this uh, hereditary by choice. Now I'm going to give this to the best actor that I think will succeed right. me. Interestingly, as soon as Carl August Göring received the ring, his career immediately took a bit of a downturn. Oh, he stopped getting. Is it cursed? I don't know, but he stopped getting <laughs> big roles. He had he had no family, so he really had no support system. Stops getting roles, and the rings really was one of the only things of value he had because he became a poor man uh, near the end of his life. He he died in 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 poverty, and so the ring he had he had been given by Georg Haas was passed down again. Now, this is interesting because the, the way that he passed down the ring was writing it in his will, who is going to receive the ring next. But since the ring technically belongs to this, the, the National Hamburg Actors Guild, when this man died, when they got word that this man died, the guild essentially sent some sort of like secret police to his house Ser to search for this will and to search for the ring. Oh. So the guild is like, this is our ring. We're going to keep it until we see who you're putting it, who you're giving yeah. it to next, right? Uh, so the guild has the ring. Eventually, it's our check mark, and we'll decide who to verify. <laughs> exactly. They're like Reddit moderators. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the guild has the ring. The will is written out. The ring passes on. The guild gives the ring to this other actor named Ludwig Brun. He gets the ring. Interestingly, as soon as he gets the ring or soon after he gets the ring, tragedy falls on him also, meaning like he got the ring and his family died in an accident. Like his, <laughs> his wife and daughter died in an accident. No, no damage to the career. So we're set there, still making money. <laughs> he dies in uh, 1924 and he gives the ring to a man called Franz Tischendorf who gets the ring. He, as soon after he gets the ring, he gets accidentally blinded at a restaurant when hot water was spilled on his eyes. Oh, what a classic. We've all been there. We've all know. been there. And because he essentially was blind, he stops acting. And, and, and so with all of this, there are now rumors that the ring is cursed. Yeah. Naturally. Naturally, you're being passed down this ring that, in a way, is making you the best actor of your generation. But at the same time... It's terrible. Some could say it's the ring that has the curse, or some could say that since you only receive the ring once you die, once this person dies, the person receiving it is also not much older. Mm. Like, like the person receiving it is an old person when they receive the ring, essentially. So maybe they just didn't get more roles because they because a seventy-five-year-old man received a ring, you know? Yeah. 
So, yeah. so there, there are thoughts of this curse, um, but it's a tradition that's been passed down for, for generations to the point where the last person that had the ring was Bruno Gans. Bruno Gans, you might actually recognize him. Uh, are you familiar with the meme of Hitler going 9999 from a movie, from the movie Downfall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bruno Gans played Hitler in that movie. Oh, it's him. He's the, the sweaty boy pounding on the table. It's the sweaty boy, the sweaty Hitler playing, uh, played by Bruno Gans, a Swiss man. Again, since this is a German, uh, German speaking role situation, so a Swiss man got it because he spoke German. Uh, yeah. He had the ring. And so he left, as, as every other person, he left in his will who would get the ring once he died. But the person he had chosen died very briefly before Bruno Gans himself died. Ooh. So what happens? The ring belongs to no one. There's a bit of an interregnum. The ring goes back to the Hamburg Guild, Ooh. and it's up to the Guild to this, to decide who is going to be uh, the new the new best actor of the generation. Mind you, this is 2019. This is a couple of years ago. When, yeah, when I was this gonna happened. say. Yeah, Bruno Gans died in, in in 2019, and now this Guild has to decide who's the greatest actor. And since the, it's up to the Guild. Most actors, because they don't want to receive this ring, started purposefully choosing bad movies to be in. Interesting. So German actors who were like considered, quote unquote, for this ring to be the best actor, they decided to choose bad roles or purposefully stopped acting briefly because they didn't <laughs> want the ring. Because no one wants the ring because of this curse associated with it. But at the same time, it's an honor to be regarded as the best living actor of, of the generation or in Germany, right? So right. it's this kind right. of divide where you, you want the ring, but at the same time you don't because you might die. Right. <laughs> you know, to, 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 put it, to put it simply, so actors would uh, choose bad roles. Like one of, the, one of the actors mainly considered for this which interestingly is named uh, Julian Julian Lenz. He he chose like to voice Paddington too. Like instead of, of going for big drama, he decided to be the dub over actor for in for Paddington too in the German dub instead of this big drama with a with a famous German director. But eventually, the guild decided who was going to receive the ring, and currently the ring lies on. Let me look up the name of this man. Oh yeah, let, let you let you look it up right now, Luis. You're probably just typing random things on a keyboard. I don't trust you for anything, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so cur currently the the person who has this ring is called Jens Hartzer, oh, sure. who received bet, it in I 2019 bet he, I bet after that's his the name. death that's of what he's called. Bruno, I bet it, I of bet Bruno Gans. <laughs> Maybe I'm just throwing this into uh, as another wrench curve. Let's I'm cut the shenanigans, Luis, okay? We both know there's so many German names in this story <laughs> that either you've got a bunch of fake names or or I'm going to think there's no way you came up with that many fake names and call you on it. We both know the, the chess game we're playing here. We'll see. We'll see. But any, anyway, all of this to say that the Franz Krauss Ichluger ring for highest achievement in acting and successful diffusion still goes on. This man that received the ring, Jens Hartzer. Now how, how old is he? Is he is he in danger of dying in a non-premature he, way? He's not. He, he's a 50-year-old man. Okay. So he's not in real. A, a seri and he seems to be doing okay. well. Currently, it's all I'm gonna say. He, uh, Jens Hartzer seems to be doing pretty okay for himself. Uh, and if, if I don't know, after this episode airs, something bad befalls upon him, I will take no responsibility. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like maybe the curse is broken. Nothing bad really happened to Bruno Gans. He died in in great renown. Uh, and now the ring is in the hands of Jens Hartzer. That's that's the the ring story, Kurt. Any questions? No, I just uh, as as previously mentioned, got a lot on my mind about what might be going on here. But okay, let me think about this story. Um, when did you say that that the ring was first created? The ring was first created in 1843. Okay, and is it is it something that actors in Germany are consciously thinking of? As, as an accolade, or is it like a lesser known kind of underground thing? It, it's 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 like a known accolade in Germany or the German speaking world. Mm. Uh, like it, it's something it's something as important, say, as like 
I don't know, a lifetime achievement award, something yeah. like that. And the ring, or like, or like a lifetime achievement Oscar, things like that. And you said the ring has the guy's face on it, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it's it has the guy's face, like like a profile. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So even though he only wore it for one year, it still kind of immortalized him in a way. Exactly. Yeah. In a way, he's still like the greatest actor of his generation, and currently his name is synonymous with the best performances in the German speaking world. So I think in a way he succeeded. Oh yeah. Know? I mean, that makes it kind of a cool story that it's like, it's both about this weird curse that may or may not exist. And about like this guy's journey to cement his place in history. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Both of those stories. have given me a lot to think about. I got to say, <laughs> I think I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm bottled up over here, Luis. Okay. We can't say it anymore. We got to move on. We got to move on. We got to move on to our favorite part of the show, which is deliberation. deliberation. Yeah. So, yes, Kurt, let me give you a quick refresher Please. on the two Please. stories. So the first story was the wonderful French duel that took place up in the skies and and gives a new meaning to the phrase wingman. Uh, <laughs> That's good. That's for the good. man that would die. Thank you. For the man that would die for you, even when you miss your blunderbuss. Mm. Then the second story is the ring, the Ich Lugen ring for best actors in Germany, which I don't know. I think a lot of German names get a lot of flack, but I think that they have a nice ring to them. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> stick to the, uh, <laughs> stick, stick to the stories. Okay. Louis, I'll do the comedy stuff. <laughs> but yeah, so those are the two stories. What do you think, Kurt? Okay. Well, I, first of all, let me say, I like both of them. Both, both of them, both of them are very fun stories. They feel very real. Originally I was finding it, hard to believe that someone could miss a hot air balloon with a blunderbuss mm -hmm. and also i was finding it hard to believe that these two guys couldn't see what a bad idea it would be to be dueling with hot air balloons <laughs> so i was pretty set on that but then when you said about uh the german actors intentionally taking bad roles so they wouldn't get the ring that part i was like i don't know i think i think if you're you're a competitive actor even if you thought I might get cursed for it, you would still try to be at the top of your game. And, and, and listen, Kurt, I will tell you, I will tell you the reason it, it wasn't all of them. It was just a couple of like a couple that were considered to, that were going like there was a pool of about 15 people that were considered to be in the running for for this ring. And only about like three or four decided. No. You know? oh, OK. And I could and I could also I could also see it being like uh, where they they took a role in a in a movie or project that ended up being pretty bad and people are speculating mm -hmm. that they knew it was going to be bad ahead of time so it might <laughs> it might not even be intentional but either way it's it's a lot to think about okay i think i can't quite get over the the whole balloon situation just the combination of both the seconds are willing to go up with them and and he <laughs> missed the balloon <laughs> and they didn't consider that like because I think sometimes in, in duels, even though it's supposed to be to the death, there's this idea of that you can work something out. Somebody gets the same face, can preserve your honor and not die. The reason the seconds are there are to diffuse the situation as much as possible so that it doesn't come to a duel. So yeah. But in this case, they're just, just more red paint for whoever's roof they land on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, all right, on, Curtis. On, so, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, on that note, I think it's pretty clear. I don't. I'm not buying your balloon blunderbuss bonanza, sir. Well, Curtis, I'm going to tell you that of the two stories you chose, the balloon to be the fake one, and I want to tell you that you are incorrect. Whoa! Sir. The balloon story is entirely real. Wow! It is one of those situations that you you hear them and say, huh? <laughs> um, I, I came across this book, this book that mentioned uh, duels. I was reading this book called The Book of Days, a miscellany of popular antiquities in Europe, as well as a newspaper article about this that mentions all of the details I told you. So Grand Pre and Le Pique did exist. Uh, they both had their seconds that were their co-pilots. They did arm themselves with blunderbusses. It was all because of an opera dancer, and <laughs> one of them fully missed a balloon. Wow. That's, 
<laughs> amazing to consider. Yeah, there's some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stories about duels in in France that will blow your mind. Uh, but this one, this one was w- really took the cake. Yeah, really took the cake. Send it flying to new heights. I think it goes to show it's it's amazing the lengths that people will go through to preserve honor or to keep their their social standing or or try yeah. to secure their their place in history or their or their I guess ranking in society. On paper, it's a really really stupid idea, which oh, maybe yeah. I probably contributed to me thinking like surely no one would be dumb enough to do this. And yet. <laughs> <laughs> but see Kurt, like this is also something that only high society would do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like Firstly, because who cares about honor? Aristocrats. Who has the money to build two gas balloons? Aristocrats. <laughs> you know, who cares about opera dancers? Aristocrats. So basically, I think the theme of the story is eat the rich. It also uh, feels very like <laughs> alternate universe. You know, like, like yeah. theories of alternate timelines where we're like using Zeppelins and stuff. <laughs> alternate timeline all duels are done from balloon this story invented the genre of steampunk yeah that's what it is there it is uh, but let's talk about the let's talk about the the german ring story yeah so let's the the german ring story kurt is based on reality is based on a thing called the ifland ring and it was supposedly worn by august wilhelm ifland okay so that's true and that's and it's a ring that exists okay however Every single detail I gave you is is false because, firstly, Ifland is only named the ring is only named after this man because people think it belonged to him. Mm. Uh, it belongs to the Austrian crown or the Austrian country. So it is. So the story is in Austria. It is in Austria. It is <laughs> I an Austrian knew it. Story. Um, <laughs> not only that, there was never a man named. Uh, Franz Ichluge, who played wow. Siegfried. Siegfried was not a common character until the Ri- Richard Wagner mm-hmm. tale. He was a bit of a folk figure, but not as big. He didn't invent it because he was aging and wanted people to recognize him. And there's really no curse associated with it other than, other than okay, you're now considered the best actor. What if you do a bad film? Mm. Nobody really has died because of this. There's no acting guild with a secret police that only cares about the ring like the ring the ring just goes to the next person it becomes like an item of of clothing uh so did did you make up the all the german names you're telling me or are they names you got from somewhere i did make up all the german names oh you scoundrel but i didn't make up bruno Gans, who did indeed play hitler that did happen that's the only german name that i that i didn't make up but every other name is is made up wow is made up uh there were no actors that purposefully uh turned down good roles for for this um None of that ever happened. Also, nothing to do with Siegfried, really at all. Like, I, I just brought in Siegfried for the fun of it. Yeah, you got me. I think it was all the names that, that got me. There was just so many names. I was like, this is totally all from a Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, one last detail I wanted to tell you, Kurt. The name Ichluge is not real. Uh, it's not an actual last name. The words Ich Lüge in German mean um, I'm lying. So from the very beginning of this story, if you had polished up your German a little bit, you would have seen through this clever disguise. Ich Lüge means I am lying. This is devastating because I knew that. I, I knew like a little bit of German at one point, enough, enough to know that that meant I'm lying. And I, so I forgot Franz it. Ich Lüge, it's just Franz, I'm lying. Um, so darn it, Franz, I put it from the very beginning, Kurt. And, uh, well, for any listeners that do know, uh, better German than us, that's a, a quick hint for you. That brings us to the end, Kurt. You, you guessed wrong. I did. I wrongly did. this time, unfortunately, uh, which means that I'm still in the lead and the <laughs> gap between you and me is still, is still rising. Ever widening. Ever widening. So I currently have six in the tally. To Kurt's three. Oh, um, it's getting ugly, dude. And it's, it's getting bad. Yeah. And 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 soon we'll we'll announce what happens when 
when we reach a high enough tally, once we reach 10, yes. there'll be something decision, fun, fun and exciting Decision pending. Going on. TBA. There will be, there will be an, an appropriate punishment or an appropriate reward. Mm. We'll see. Mm. <laughs> with that, with those two stories, we're going to bring Unbelievable to an end. What did you think? Were you able to guess correctly? Were you able to see through the German lies that I put forward in this episode or were you caught up by the high flying stories of balloon duels let us know we are on instagram and twitter on twitter at unbelievable pc and on instagram at unbelievable pod you can find us everywhere you look for your podcast whether that be google or spotify or apple i guess uh, <laughs> uh give us a review if you if you'd like if you won't if you don't want to do that that's okay too we'll just sit crying at home mm. my name is luis mejia joined here by the ever lovely and striking gorgeous blue eyes kurt danner oh little old me come on now and we'll go and we'll catch you on the next time see if you can figure out the lies that kurt will have for me so until next time see ya bye everyone kill your friends in a hot air balloon <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.